Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Rosen Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I'm really pleased to be joined by CEO and Head of Research, Brunella Rosa. This week, we're discussing how after falsified presidential elections, Vladimir Putin is tr- turning Russia into a bit of a war economy. Uh, we've, you know, these weren't the most surprising elections, we can say, uh, of of uh, sort of a record year of elections happening this year. Uh we, you know, to some degree knew what the outcome would be, but we were closely watching how it would be presented uh, to the public to decipher, you know, things about Putin's position domestically within Russia. But what have we learned so far, Brunello? Yeah, you're right. Um, this election was the one whose result was uh, least uncertain, I would say. But as we said several times, it's still important to watch elections also in autocracies when they are the so-called electoral autocracies such as Russia, because we learn a lot about the state of legitimacy of the regime. So what we have looked uh, is at is the turnout, um, the number of contenders, and then the eventual results. So in terms of turnout, it was 77.5%, which is very high by any historical standard, is even 10% higher than uh, six years ago in 2018, which means that somehow it was, I think, incentivized, let's put it that way. In terms of the number of contenders, again, no good news. There was one easy contender from the Communist Party, um, but then the real contender, as we know, died just before the election, Alexei Navalny, and the uh, other anti-war candidate that was there, uh, Boris Nadezhin, um, was excluded just before the poll because of supposed irregularities in the um, uh, signature uh, for his campaign. So no great contenders there. Then in terms of um, actual results, Putin goes 88%. 0.5% of the votes, again, very, very high by any historical standard. And um, this is when suspicions start to emerge. There was the use of the electronic vote for the first time, which, uh, which had the layers of um, opacity, if you want, because you press a button. And then what happens after that is totally obscure. Nobody really knows. So, uh, And this leads to our fourth point, which is on the regularity of the electoral process. I mean, there have been widespread reports, very public, honestly, on all sorts of irregularities from armed people entering the electoral uh, uh, box, from packs of pre-voted ballots being bo- uh, put on the ballot boxes and so on. I mean, all these really uh, cast a huge shadow on uh, the regularity of the process. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what have we kind of learned from all these elements? Because we know for a certainty that Putin has at least six more years uh, as effectively supreme leader of Russia. What is he going to do with all this, you know, reinstated power? So, you're correct. So, Putin has at least six years ahead of himself. Could be 12 if he, if he runs again. In 2030, so it could be 18 at this point. Yeah, I mean, if because he can uh, uh, run again because he changed the constitution in his own favor, so um, clearly uh, he has a mandate for life at this point. Um, And uh, he achieved what he wanted. Um, And then the question is, as you correctly uh, asked, is what is he going to do with his uh, power? Well, what he's doing already is turning Russia into a war economy. For example, the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, recently outlined the various efforts that the military is doing in order to increase its capacity. There are two new armies being fought, formed, 14 divisions, 16 brigades by the end of this year. So, no, literally in the next uh, nine months. Um, and this is just one of the many uh, projects that lead to that. Um, and they will be used for the war in Ukraine, but not just the war in Ukraine. Now, we had last weekend 
uh, the terrorist attack in Moscow. You all know that. Um, there has been an attempt by the regime to blame the Ukrainians. Easy, right? But then, you know, the ISIS uh, said, it's our job, we did it. Then they arrested four of um, the gunmen. They were all Tajiki. Um, so very hard to sell the Ukrainian narrative. They tried to say they were escaping towards Ukraine. That's not also either very credible. Who wants to cross the borders this day? I mean, come on, if you want to escape. So in any case, they will blame the Ukrainians in no matter what, just to uh, mm. find yet another reason to escalate uh the the war during the you know spring is beginning summer is coming we know there are offensive and counter offensive during this period so this will happen for sure um and then of course internally putin will definitely use these attacks to further militarize um the control of the territories of the city and so on and so forth you know a, a bit like what happened in the us post 9-11 so uh a, you know, a war economy militarized domestically is kind of the complete picture of a regime that is taking full control of uh, of the country. And, you know, by any standard, this is not a good development, in our opinion. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, that's, you know, compounded onto the sort of additional uncertainty we'd have with the uh, Trump presidency. Uh, and how that would, you know, play into the calculus of leaving, leaving NATO to its own devices and the nuclear umbrella over Europe, among other things. So uh, certainly a lot more uncertainty to come uh, in the year ahead that we'll keep analyzing. So as always, Brunello, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Until next time.